St. Patrick's Day, should we all talk with an Irish girl? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I actually thought about changing my name to Catherine just for this hour so we could have a Mary and Margaret and Catherine. But oh, that would be great. You, you just want to call me Catherine? That's fine. <laughs> don't don't call me Katie, just Catherine. Yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit because again, that's what I was saying. Other than this silhouette of the head and the ears, the Mickey Mouse, Tinkerbell is Disney, right? I think so. I think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I've enjoyed it for, um, in May um, 11th, which will be my 94th birthday, uh, I will have been in show business for uh, 90 years. Wow. And, yes, and I've had a wonderful time. And of course, Tinkerbell is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think you all adore her. I adore her. And I adore you too. Oh. <laughs> Tinkerbell's so cool. But it, it's, uh, I want to announce that in February 5th, last month, it was the 70th anniversary for the movie Peter Pan. Wow. Woo! Now, to get that into, uh, well, whatever I'm giving it into. Um, <clears throat> I did the work for Peter, uh, for Tinkerbell 72 years ago. Woo! It just seemed like that. <laughs> it seems like everybody knows Tinkerbell and the little kids that come up and talk to you are the big guys who come up and show the tattoo yeah. on their <laughs> it, it, They're all named Michael. I don't know. <laughs> But it, it's just been an absolutely wonderful time, and you know show business, and you know show business, and there's nothing like it. I, yeah, absolutely. Now, there's a discussion going on in the culture about nepotism babies. Mary. Can I get How did you, you land that job? Can you use that word in a sentence, please? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you got roped into having to be in the booth. <laughs> yeah, so I was uh, I was two and a half to three and a half, and um, just kind of fell into the role. Uh, my dad was a storyboard artist at Disney and Pixar for over 30 years. Uh, his first movie was actually Cool World, and then uh, went on to... Oh, wow. That's yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and then Pocahontas after that, and then switched over to, to Pixar. Obviously, was working on Monsters, Inc., and originally, they just needed a little girl to draw. And so by no means were my parents trying to force me into the business or anything like that. Um, but I was brought in. I would just play around my dad's studio, and they would sketch me. And then as the movie progressed, they're like, well, she's doing great. She's a natural born star. And uh, so from two and a half to three and a half, not really. But I, I would just follow around with a microphone for a year of my life. But um, yeah, that's like what got me started. And uh, yeah, it was cool to be a part of that. And 20-something years later, it still be a uh, an iconic movie, not as iconic as Peter Pan, but, but yeah, iconic. Honor to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Did we have any questions? Did you have a question? Are you in line or are you just sitting there? Okay, I never, I can never tell with the lights up here, so I'm in charge. If I could add to that. Yeah, go ahead, please do. Uh, I started in show business when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was adopted, my mother passed away, and I, of course, I was born in 1929. I caused the depression. <laughs> <laughs> Everything went right downhill after that. It was just an amazing time, and my mother passed away, and I was adopted by two people who were old enough to be my parent, my grandparents. They both were born in 1883. Wow. Now, wow. try that one on. So, <clears throat> I went into show business not knowing what was going on, but it was important because I could make $6.50 a day wow. working in the movies, and the 50 cents was for car fare, and I got to hold it in my hand as we drove home. I had to give it back, of course, but the point was that I was there because that's what you had to do to make money. You could buy a steak dinner for 75 Whoa. cents at that point. So that was that was great pay for a kid. And yeah. I took to it, um, enjoyed it. I thought everybody was a little bit nuts, but nobody ever asked my opinion. <laughs> it's just get out there and do it. You say, okay. And I had the most wonderful, adorable, annoying mother who would always tell me that I was doing something not quite good enough and which was not the way to approach me, but I tried and I tried. And she would get on the set and she would watch me over there and she would go, she would go. <laughs> <laughs> and she acted out most of the day <laughs> doing that. 
but working in the art gang comedies, I was in six of those. I learned to tap dance when I was four, and I uh, had a wonderful, wonderful time. I loved tap dancing. And then I worked with uh, Marilyn Monroe. I worked with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I walked, worked with uh, um, The Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. I worked with The Three Stooges. Yes. I worked with wonderful, wonderful people. And I just had a grand time. Eddie Cantor, which of course taught me how to do the eyes. Did you know I could do the, watch this. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my show business. And I went into doing, uh, after doing, uh, many people don't know that I'm also the mermaid. The yes, the mermaid. mermaid in the movie. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> I went in to do, um, um, I just want to, one, one thing, and I will get off in a moment, but, but Mark Davis, Mark Davis, I have to give him all the credit. I have my book, which I dedicated to Mark. He was one of the nine old men of Disney, one of the great artists. And if you've been to Disneyland, you've, you've enjoyed his uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, Cruella de Vil. It just goes on and on. And of course, Tinkerbell and Mr. and Mrs. Darling that were in the... So he's the one who cast me in the role. And I always want to give him... I'll, I'll, and a little bit later, if we have time, I will do the little paragraph out of James M. Barry's book, the only description that he ever had for Tinkerbell, as far as we know. So I have had a wonderful showbiz time, and showbiz people are the greatest, and I and you're the greatest because you're part of it, whether you say. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> I think that's about my rambling that I'm going to do another <laughs> thing. That can be. Okay. So you both got into the business at a young age, and yet you're both so well adjusted as adults. What kind of kept you both well? Mark, uh, <laughs> my, my parents both the most part. Yeah, we. Um, I did a couple of, uh, auditions after I was five when the movie came out. And I walked into one audition, it was for um, the niece in Santa Claus 2 with Tim Allen. And we walk in and there's all these pageant girls with their moms doing this. Yeah. You know? And uh, I came from Disneyland and I had a flannel shirt on and a stain down my shirt. And I got the role, but we realized it just the, it wasn't like for me. Um, and I got put in public school and lived a normal life. <laughs> so that's why I'm not insane. But Margaret, tell us your secrets. Why are you insane, Margaret? Because pretty sane too. So. <laughs> Well, the, the biggest difference, too, was I did not really like making movies. Oh, my dears, it is so boring, I cannot tell you. And particularly if you were a child actor, because you could only work 20 minutes out of an hour in front of the camera, and then you could only work three times uh, for three hours a, a day, and then you were stuck in this little room with a lady who loved you. I mean, she was a social worker, or the teacher, and you, you had to speak, whisper the whole time. And then they gave you books to read that you couldn't and had nothing to do with what you, you were doing. And then they would go the next day and do it all over again because they changed their minds. And then I found a thing called television <laughs> where you did it once and that was it. And if you blew it, you blew it. If you didn't, you, you said, patted yourself on the back. So, it moved me into a whole new structure of television. I did 172 half-hour shows for ABC for Charlie Ruggles Network. And back-to-back, uh, -back, I mean, it, it was something I never thought, but you did it, you know? But I don't like the stage. Uh, really? I don't think anybody could get me to do a stage play. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. It, it, we're all different. When anybody asks me, how do I tell somebody how they should study for show business? I say, pick the area that you want to do. Uh, stage acting is so different than movie acting that is so different than television acting. You know, you can go on and on. So pick one that you really would be interested in doing. I can't, can I stop for a minute and tell you something? Yes, huh? Did you ever hear of eyebrow acting? <laughs> I'll bet not. But one of the things that I learned for television for doing commercials, and then I'll shut up. I no, promise. No, 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 no. And, well, you know when you're, you're you're eating something, right? And the sponsor wants you to look like you look. Well, we would go. Oh, mm, 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 
like it. No, you wouldn't get the job. What you go is, oh, with the eyebrows up. And that's how you got the job. So if you were doing a television commercial, and that's a whole different part of the business, which is great fun, great fun. Um, that's what you, that's what you learn the tricks. That's what you're, you learn how to do it. And that's what you enjoy. So some people are in show business and, for example, in the movies, and didn't like it. I didn't. I like television. So it explains where we move around and we're free to, to figure it out ourselves. Or a uh, little darling, uh, annoying mother will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> And you've both done voice work as well. You talked about the radio. Yes. You've done plenty more, obviously, Boo, but then also you've got the, the podcast, the audio drama, the seven episodes. Tell us a little bit about that and what the difference is between that versus stage or cartoons or commercials or what. Yeah, so I, growing up, people would always ask me if I wanted to get back into voice acting. And I didn't. I knew I didn't want to just go and go to a million auditions, but I always knew, you know, if just somehow I like, was in the right place at the right time or whatever, and I fell into my lap, then I, I'm not going to say no. And so at one of my Comic Cons, uh, I started doing cons about four years ago, I was approached by C. Andrew Nelson. Um, he was one of the voices of Darth Vader, um, and he does a lot of the, or did a lot of the special effects in Star Wars. And he's producing this audio show, um, it's now an LLC called Adventurous Ideas. But the audio show that they're producing underneath that is called Heroes of Extinction. And that's about the superhero that as he gets older, he's losing his powers and he's looking for a second in line. And so Andrew approached me and he was like, and that, that character is Janessa. And he approached me and he said, I see you as one of the main roles in this audio show. And it's kind of like an homage to like old radio shows. And I told him, I was like, you know, I've never acted. <laughs> I was like, I was followed around with the microphone. But he's like, no, I have faith in you. And so, um, yeah, and I, I used to do like musical theater, and I actually liked um, stage, like stage shows when I was younger. And then I auditioned for Wizard of Oz in sixth grade, and they made me do it in front of all the eighth graders. And I froze, I cried, I ran off stage. So ever since then, I have a little bit of like PTSD from that. And so especially when Andrew approached me, he's like, "Oh, you want to record?" I'm like, "Ah, like I'm gonna freeze and cry." Um, but anyway, he's a really good director, and um, he really talks me through it. And uh, so yeah, I call that like dipping my toe back into voice acting and um, Heroes of Extinction. You can find the first episode on YouTube. And everything else will be released on uh, podcasts and Spotify and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a lot of fun. Andrew's really good at, like, if I have to be mad, kind of describing a scene or a situation in which I would be mad. And I'm like, but it is hard to try to, like, conjure those emotions, like, out of thin air, alone in a booth uh, with your director on Skype, you know? Right. Uh, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's cool to, like, kind of get back into it. And now we're doing podcasts, which are essentially radio plays, where, where it's coming full circle again. It's so interesting the way the business yeah, works like that. It's cool, like, the production is with all like those sound effects, it really pulls you in and like, it's like, I mean, it's a yeah, audio show, but you really use your imagination to like envision the whole thing, so. It is, yeah, full circle. Well, you, you were talking about voiceovers. <clears throat> when I did the Redhead Moment of Mermaids, uh, I was just in seventh heaven because Mark Davis said, would you like to do it? Would, all the E always asked, would it be convenient for you to come? I've never been, where they asked whether it was convenient, you know, you would, would show up or else. Anyway, uh, many of you know the name June Foray. Well, June was the dark-haired mermaid. And we stepped outside after we did the track for, for the scenes. And we had gotten there at 1.30 in the afternoon at Disney Studio and went to the sound stage. And, and we were, <clears throat> we were uh, rehearsing. Um, and then we would do the, the voices. And we would try all kinds of dummy voices. You know, and when you do, you know, kind of thing, and whatever it was, and they would say, no, we want this, that, and the other. So after we, afterwards, um, um, Connie Haynes was the blonde, and I don't know what ever happened to Connie. Maybe she got sense and left to uh, some other business. But we stepped outside and we said, why are we looking for on-camera shows to do? This is the way to do it. You come at 1.30, you don't have to dress up, no costumes. Your hair can be any way that you want it to. Uh, they give you a script so you don't have to learn anything. And you try it over and over and over again. And so uh, June, of course, was famous for her voiceover work, um, much more than I am. I've done over 600 cartoons. That's what I love doing from uh, my new husband thinks that's the greatest thing that I do, are, are dialects. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
So that was another field in the business. So you get another agent, a different person. It's really very interesting to find out with the baseball. But I want to say this. I speak 21 different dialects and I have 48 different voices. And that's a lot for a little girl like me. But how do you get the dialects? Oh, I'll tell you way back. Do any of you watch the Andy Griffith show? Okay. You know Hal Smith, who, who played uh, the drum, Otis? Yeah. Well, Hal did about 10,000 voices. And I knew him from family, we were friends, etc. So Hal was about my height, and we would have the same microphone. And this is how we would learn a dialect. <clears throat> I would come up to him and I would say, uh, Hal? He'd say, what? I said, it says here I'm supposed to have a German accent. I don't do a German accent. He would say, you don't do a German accent. You come over here with me and I will show you how to do this. And I said, you will? He says, yeah. He says, you need a sentence? I need a sentence? He says, yeah. So the woman was looking out the window when we bent. He said, that's what I use. And he went back and, and, and I could do a German accent. That's how we learned all, we don't use dialects much anymore, but it'll come back, I'm sure. But that's how you stood back and I, as I say, I had 21 different dialects. You know, that's quite a bit, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And uh, all the way, and of course today we should be doing it with an Irish accent, you know. Well, shouldn't we? Well, of course. So, so that was a whole new field of doing and then I did secret of the age of the axe. And, uh, and they loved me when I worked with the Three Stooges. And they're, I did, they loved my baby crying. And evidently that's hard to, to, to do, or, or at least they thought it was good. <laughs> and so they had wrote in babies a whole bunch into the, the scripts. But as I say, here's another part of the industry that you could fall in love with, and not like this part over here. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead, Dan. You were there. I, it's my fault. I kept asking questions. I should have gone to you first. I apologize. Hi. What's your name? My name's Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi. So I just want to thank you. I, I love both your characters um, in Boo and Tinkerbell. When you were such young, going into voice acting, how did you find your true voice? And was there ever a, a difficulty in finding a difference from your character to your true voice? And when you have thoughts in your head, what voice character is in your head? You know what? You're going to hate me. I'm 94 years old and I couldn't quite hear all of that. So she oh. asked me, when you're doing voice work, how do you separate the you, yeah, especially younger getting into the industry. Just have fun. I'll show you how. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> we use the phrase, and you probably know this, from aha mama. That opens up your throat. Try it, everybody. Aha ah, 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 ah. ah, ah. Okay, now this time, <clears throat> put it up in your nose. Aha ah, mama. Aha ah, ah, mama. Ah, ah. Now put it all the way down in your throat. Oh, 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 see, you can do it, or you can be Catherine Hepburn and keep it in the middle of your mouth and not move it any place at all. <laughs> so those are, the, those are the things that you learn as you go, and they can put you into the character. Um, they have sketches most of the time that, that, that you go, oh, I can figure that one out. Secret of the Attack was very easy. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, it, it's and well, as you can <laughs> you can imagine. I do like to do. Uh, I have a story to tell you. <laughs> okay, I have. A, uh, I'm sorry, I'm cutting down on questions here. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I was adopted, uh, my mother was gone. Uh, they never told anybody about your family or anything. <clears throat> You're supposed to not never to have remembered it. Well, that's nonsense. I remembered it. <clears throat> but I always had an idea that I was Irish. Always. Excuse me for a minute. There we go. And uh, so uh, when I started on the stage and doing shows and so on, I would tell this joke. And uh, now, this is an all ages crowd out here. So, yeah, this, okay. okay, just making sure we're all on so, the same page here. So, anyway, 
we heard the dirtiest joke in the Tinkerbell panel. Oh, yes, I tell jokes all the time, and, and, and uh, the good Lord loves me. So, but anyway, this is in a pub over in Ireland. And these men, two of the guys, are talking about diversity, you know. I don't think I'd like to be an Italian, says one. And the other says, oh, you'd love it. All the girls would be around you. No, I don't think so. And they said, let's go ask Paddy. He'll know, he'll know. So they go over to where Paddy is, and he's knocking them back pretty good. And they said, Paddy, he says, what is it? What would you be if you weren't Irish? He says, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> so 50 years later, I found out I was Irish, so it works. But those are the kind of things that you, you, you work with and you change and you make people laugh. And that's what show business is all about. You're entertaining people. That is your joy in life. Uh, I will go down to East Podunk, Iowa, if they want me to, to talk in the library. It is my joy to entertain people. That's what I was made for. And after a while, you figure that out. East Podunk is just south of Des Moines, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, going after a question, um, I think, because at first I was just brought in because they needed a little girl to draw, and I was comfortable around everyone. Um, Pete Doctor is a, uh, was a director. I went to preschool with his son, um, and so I knew him, I knew my dad, I like, was brought in to work before. So it was, like, it was a comfortable setting for me, and so once they decided to actually use me for the voice, we went into like the actual recording studio, we walked in, and um, my mom saw a crew of like 20 people. She's like, is this all for my daughter? And, you know, I thought I was going to freeze up, and apparently I just walked in like I owned the place. Uh, but I think like part of that, so like I don't remember ever. I think it was just my voice, uh, and even in the audio show that I do now, it's just my voice. I don't. I wish I had a bunch of cool act, like accents and voices, but um, yeah. So like I think, uh, and I don't even think I knew what I was doing, you know. <laughs> so I didn't think the yeah until I was about five, you know. <laughs> then when we came out, I was like, oh, yeah. Well, like, you know, and Cookie Monster would talk to me if they wanted me to say kitty in a certain way, like, oh, what would you say if you lost your kitty? Um, but yeah, I don't remember like trying to think of a voice in my head. I just remember like, you know, it was my dad's work and I was just being myself and they followed me around with a microphone and he, the sound guy had to wear socks so he didn't make any like footsteps. Um, but yeah, and then, and yes, like the voice, like what character is in my head and I'm just like singing all the time in my head. So <laughs> that's, that's nice. what goes on up there. <laughs> I wish I spoke Irish in my head though. <laughs> Hi, come on up. What is your name and what is your question? Hello, my name is Cassie. Hi, Cassie. Um, being that you guys are both um, historic parts of the Disney verse, do you have any plans to visit Marceline, Missouri while you're here? So oh. Yes, where Disney is. Yeah, I actually talked to someone came up to my booth today that told me that she is part of um, part of a committee that helped kind of something about like a historical right? preservation. Committee. Oh yeah, she's right there. Hey. <laughs> She told me about it. What was it that you were talking about? Well, thank you, Walt Disney. They're the ones that are actually doing the putting the back up the left room. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I was just heard about it. Tinkerbell knows uh, the lady that's running the the, the uh, what's her, uh, you know she knows who runs uh, Marceline's uh, um, the the thing for Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So you can't mm -hmm. for talking about it. So I just found out about it for the first time like an hour ago, and I would love to see that. Uh, like fortunate thing about these cons is we normally fly in like the day of and leave the night of, but I actually leave Monday night, and so hopefully Monday day I could kind of do some uh, sightseeing like that. That'd be nice. Yeah. Have you been there? No, no. I, I've been. I don't think so, but I'm not yeah. four. I might have been there. I might have been. She met Kay. She met Lady that runs it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a piece of information. I'll, I'll make it as quick as I can. As you know, that's the 70th anniversary of the movie Peter Pan. And my friend Jim Corcus, who's probably one of the best history writers of Disney that's around, uh, has written a book called uh, Return, uh, Return to Neverland. Mm -hmm. And in it, he puts some stories. And you may know this story, but I thought you would get a kick out of it. Think back, uh, any time that you have read about uh, who is going to play Peter Pan in the stage play, which was the original 1906. And from then on, Maude Adams, the great actress, and it goes on and on and on as females that play the, well, there was a male 
who played Peter Pan. And his initials were W-E-D. Can you guess who that might have been? Yes, it was Walt Disney. Wow. Yes. And it was, seems that Maud Adams traveled with the um, Peter Pan show on a train, which was quite the thing that they did. And they took the whole cast with them and uh, all of the uh, paraphernalia that they needed. And her train car was called Tinkerbell, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so she got to, to uh, Missouri. And they set it up, and they did the show there, and she played Peter Pan. And when the school saw that later on, they decided that they would make do the show too. And they chose Walt Disney to be Peter Pan, and his brother was the one who pulled the ropes and let him fly around, and they knocked down a couple of scenes of scenery. But, at, you know, it's such fun to think of that, of why he really remembered it and wanted, and wanted to do it. Yes? That's fantastic. So that's a piece of information that Jim Corcus, if you see his book, uh, Return to Neverland, uh, read it. You will be so surprised at the history that he has in there. I said you wanted to read to us the short, the only description of Tinkerbell that... that well, I'm showing was. off when they do it, so oh. is that all right? Yeah, yeah. you, you have to memorize it. You got it memorized? So, I don't know if any of you noticed, but in the movie, and also, uh, not in the book, but in the movie, everyone once spoke with a British accent, except for Bobby. He did not, and Bobby could have done it. He was a great actor. He won a junior award, an uh, Oscar. I don't know if you know that. But anyway, uh, there is a, only a paragraph that about that big in the book of, by James M. Berry explaining who Tinkerbell is. And if I may, I'm going to do it in an accent. This is just from memory, so. <clears throat> and it goes. In the nursery, the little night lights were burning brightly as Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Darling left for the party. But in the time it's taken me to tell you, there was a great light that came into the room and was in every pocket and every drawer in the nursery looking for Peter Pan's shadow. But when it stopped, you realized it was not a light, but it was a fairy, a girl named Tinkerbell no larger than your hand and still growing. She was dressed in skeletal leaf, cut low and square, which showed her body to best advantage. Saucy. That was nice. it. And that man, Mark Davis, took that and turned it into Tinkerbell, who is still known. She's recognized in Outer Mongolia. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine that? Okay, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, that's, that's cool. So, obviously Mark's working from that, but that's not all he's working from, because okay. you are performing this. Yes. Talk to us a little bit, because you have, again, very little direction there, so how was the collaboration between you and Mark and <clears throat> getting the characters? Well, if I may, I'm a dancer. Now, what, I back up to those people who still believe it was Marilyn Monroe, who was the... Uh, uh, lady who did it. Uh, Marilyn could not have done it for many reasons. I had worked with Marilyn. I thought she was incredible. She could do anything. However, at that point, she was under contract to 20th Century Fox, and they were building her to be a star. They were not going to loan her out to be a reference model. And secondly, she didn't dance. Later on, she had the greatest moves, but at that point, she didn't. So, <clears throat> may I show you the, what I did on the first scene that they asked me to do in Mark Davis's office to see whether I could do what they want. Here, let me move this table out of your way. Okay, go ahead. This is on the uh, mirror. mirror. <laughs> if, you, if you 
look at Tinker Bell, everything that she does is a dancer's walk. One other thing, this is my walk, which is just great, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but her walk is a dancer's walk. Do you see the difference? And everything that she does, she poses. Even when she does this, it's a dancer's walk. So Marilyn, at that point, couldn't have done it, and little old me did it. <laughs> What other questions do you guys have? Because we have just a little bit of time left, not a whole lot, but we want to get there. You told me we had all day. I did tell you that. Joey said we had three, four hours. We, this, this reconvenes at the bar day. afterwards. <laughs> well. It is, it is St. Patrick's Day. That's true. That's true, man. Yes. Other questions? Can we take you home? Can we take you home? <laughs> to your home or her home? No, she's coming with me. <laughs> Hi, what is your name and what is your question? Hi, my name's Holly. Hi, Holly. Uh, and I have a question for Margaret. Um, with the like Tinkerbell movies that came out, the 3D animated ones, did you like watch any of them? Did you like how they characterized her or how they voiced her? Or do you prefer her without a voice? Oh, okay. Whether she should be silent? I don't think Tinkerbell could probably be silent. <laughs> I mean, she's all female. <laughs> that's, that's the way I, I felt. But, but Mark said to me, <clears throat> he decided, he was one of those who decided that she would not, she'll do pantomime. And I'm a pantomimist. That's one of the things that I did and more why I was called in. <clears throat> but he said, I think it's much more interesting that we do it with the body and the movement. When they made the new uh, Tinkerbell, uh, where she talked with the, um, the other fairies that came along, I, they called me in and I, we talked about it and we talked with the director and all the rest. And then they told me this wonderful thing because people fell in love with her, that they were going to change her slightly to where she taught a, a lesson. In every, if you go back and see all of those pictures that she did with her fairy, there's a lesson in every single one of them. So her talking with May Whitman, May <clears throat> is an adorable lady, and just was so excited to, to, to do the voice of Tinkerbell, I could hardly have her sit down. She, she's just precious. So to me, it, it worked, the whole thing worked, and I love the idea that they were moving her along so that the thing that I don't didn't like too much was some of the artists that got going to make Tinkerbell look like um, like she was 32 years old and had been around the block. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, because t I I played Tinkerbell as a nine-year-old, and that's an innocent person who could hardly wait to see what happened and not realizing what trouble she could get into. But she was going to find out about it and it adventure home. So no, it was fine with me. And and Meg, I wouldn't have missed her her excitement for the world. That block that Tinkerbell had been around was in the East Podunk, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> that was the particular block. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. Good question. Hi, step on up. What is your name and what is your question? My name is Dion. Hi. So my question is for both of you. Uh, if you could voice any other Disney character, which one would it be? Mm -hmm. If you could voice any other Disney character, which, I'm sorry. If you could voice any other Disney character, which would you like to voice? Oh my! You start talking, I'll think about that. <laughs> That's what I was hoping you would do. That's a hard one. It is. There's a lot to choose from. There is a lot. Uh, I mean, it would be cool to be one of the Disney princesses, you know, so. Is there a particular one? Uh, my favorite was The Little Mermaid, so I'll be Ariel. That'll be my voice. Now. You have to question. sing for that, too. Oh, gosh. Oh, okay. I, I, I can't hit the high notes, but. <laughs> um. <clears throat> The one that they haven't cast me in yet. Oh, oh the next one. There you go. Hey, I'm not, I haven't been around for 94 years. That's an actor's answer right there. The next one. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. 
Any other questions? Don't be shy. We have uh, just a few minutes left. No? All right. You're lost, because I'm going to ask the rest of it. So tell us a little bit about what you guys have going on. You're in Nostalgia Alley. You're there with a few other folks. Tell us a little bit about how you're set up and what these people can do when they leave here. If they were too shy to ask into a microphone in front of a group of people and they want to come up and meet you. Tell us a little bit about what all you guys have going on this weekend. Well, like you said, we're in Nostalgia Alley. We're in the celebrity row, but we're like across the alley. So we can't miss us. Um, and you're right side by side, right? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're right next to each other. We're also with Debbie from Home Improvement. The other two people, I'm over my head. Uh, but I'm sure you guys would recognize them. <laughs> Sorry, if they're here. Um, uh, yeah, we have uh, Margaret selling her book. I got Pops and the screen canister that screams when you open it. And you probably you have a lot of stuff. Do you want to share something that was down there? No, I don't. Oh. What do you have here underneath the couch? I thought... Let me get for you. They might get a kick out of it. Yeah. See? Yeah, that was that's in my book. I was four years old at the time, and we got started in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and I played a fairy. Oh wow! That was the Thanks first time that I ever met uh, Mickey Rooney. Yeah, that was that was an interesting time. <laughs> and then this one, I thought. You might like to see me in action. So that's the way. So we have a, some of those there. Thank you, love. And uh, I, I just uh, I, the idea of having somebody walk up to me and to say that Tinker Bells meant so much in their life. I can't tell you what it means. I just there's there's no way I can tell you. Um, but I will tell you one little bit of information. I get fan mail for Tinkerbell. Oh. I don't know how it came to me, but it ends up in my place, and I'm delighted. And are you ready for this? There's <clears throat> 26 males write to me, men write to me, for one female. It's men that are interested in Tinkerbell and want the pictures. And they're the same guys who sidled up to me and the Michaels that I told you about that roll up their sleeves. But they say the nicest things about her. It, it's just, it is, but it's a surprise to me that it's 26 to 1. So, um, it, it, it's, I, I uh, protect her at all times. And I protect me. I'm not going to do anything dumb, I hope. And the good Lord protects me too, which uh, it, it's. And Disney has that feeling of love. I have not seen the new movie. It comes out the 24th, the new live action movie. I don't know whether it's going to show the same love that the original did 70 years ago. Wait, there's a live action Peter Pan coming out? I, 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 I pray that it, it will because that's what we love. Um, I will tell you a funny story about love. Um, my new husband, I got married three years ago. Uh, he was, uh, he's now 97. Wow. And he can do 100 sit-ups. So can I, he's in 100 wow. days. <laughs> one a day for one hundred. I can do 40. Uh, wow. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, be, where was I going? You're not I'm sorry. I was about to brag about your husband, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he never saw uh, Peter Pan. Really? He never saw an Andy Griffith show. Uh, doing the Andy Griffith show, um, May Mayberry Days, up in North North Carolina, up, up in Mount Airy. I, I, I'll remember it. Um, and so I, I met him up there, and I. We dated 70 years before. What? Really? 70 felt. He is a hero of World War II. Woo! And, uh, yes. um, and he was over in Europe for the, uh, uh, not celebration, but the commemoration of D-Day, the 75th one. So they invited him over to be, and he was there with friends, and he had to go to Amsterdam. 
and uh, to pick up the ship that he was going to be touring on with all the rest. And he and his friends, listen to this, he and his friends went driving with the Uber, Uber uh, down the road to see what Amsterdam was like. And there across the street, I'm not joking, I have pictures of it, was a store that said Tinkerbell's Toys. <laughs> what Tinkerbell was doing in Amsterdam. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he turned to his friends and he said, did I tell you that I dated Tinkerbell 70 years ago? And they said, let's send her an email. Oh. I got a call. I said, of course I remember him. We dated about 15 times. I think that was, that was it. I remembered him all those years. He met me up in Mount Airy because we were doing Mayberry Days. He had driven up after his 24th, at 94th birthday. He'd driven up for eight hours. We saw each other, and I think you'll get, I'm gonna tell this funny, I think you'll like. Um, anyway, so he started helping with all, not knowing anything about showbiz. The 6,000 people that were there, he was helping with it. So we had breakfast the next morning at the Crocker Barrel, nice. Cracker Barrel. And uh, his opening line to me, ladies and gentlemen, was, I have to buy you a new house. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where are those guys? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what do you say to that? And then he followed it up, and he has the most gorgeous voice. He followed up and said, but it has to be near a Costco's. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, I shop at Costco's. And I, to, to make it light, right? I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me you're a member of Costco? And he said, yes. I said, you have a Costco card? He said, yes. You'd let me use your Costco card? And he said, yes. I said, will you marry me? And he said, yes. put it all together, and we were married the next February 14th, wow. St. Valentine's Day. And it was because of Tinkerbell, and God sent them down the right road, because they could have gone down any road. And I could yeah. marry them. Three years, and it's just, he's, it's been wonderful. And then he's so pleased that I can come and talk to all of you. And he understands now what the love between uh, Tinkerbell and people is. It, it's wonderful to watch him grow up <laughs> and know what's going on. But I thought you'd like that wonderful yeah, story. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the enduring legacy of both of your characters. It's an innocence, it's a joy, it's that, yes. not naive, but childlike wonder at the world. And I think that what you both brought to those is why we're sitting here celebrating both of you because of what you have accomplished and how it has touched all of us. So let's give a big round of applause.